Well, thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Dr. Alexander and the Faye family for inviting me here to a beautiful part of the country. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this tonight because this is so core to what I do and what my group does. And, you know, there's a, uh, you know, it's even more fun to talk to a relatively lay audience because you know, there is a public health aspect to psychiatric neurosurgery. And, you know, the last couple of years, obviously the public health consciousness has been sort of co-opted by, by COVID. And, you know, there's other things that deserves to share that stage. We are, we are not just one element and humankind's health is multifaceted. And this is a really interesting facet that I'm privileged to work in and to discuss with you this evening. Okay. So, um, you know, we talk about the cutting edge as the, 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 the frontier of any sort of scientific or technological endeavor. But, you know, what is the cutting edge? And, you know, I was thinking about it and, you know, I came across this, this quote about, about King Solomon in Ecclesiastes, he notes that there's this cyclical nature of things that appear to be very new, that they are in fact coming from the old and that there is no new thing under the sun. And so even as I show you how psychiatric surgery is really the cutting edge of brain surgery right now, there are elements that you're gonna see that come from the depths of, of history that just keep coming up and over again. There's this marvelous cyclical nature to the way mankind moves forward. In fact, it's not just a cutting edge, it's the very first cut. The oldest surgical operation known to man was in fact for something that was to alleviate something like psychiatric disease. Um, texts, early texts note this operation of trephination, this hole made in the skull was designed to liberate bad spirits or demons that was causing problems in patients. And this continued well into the Middle Ages. So let's talk about the very first cutting edge in neuroscience, localization and the frontal lobe. So in 1862, Paul Broca ushers in the concept of localization to neuroscience. And what localization holds is that there are specific areas of the brain that are suited to a particular task or behavior. Now, to even everybody sort of today, that's like a G, of course. But you have to understand at the end of the 19th century, the idea that any aspect of cognition came from the brain was a controversial one. The idea that there was a material aspect to what makes us inherently human was wildly new stuff. And this concept of localization, that the idea that there are parts of the brain that are specific to a computational task that results in doing everything from hitting a tennis ball to writing a sonata is so fundamental to the modern understanding of the brain. So fast forward to the 20s and you have John Fulton, the chairman of the Yale's physiology department, and coincidentally, the, the Harvey Cushing Societies, which is the precursor to the American Association of Neurological Surgery's second president, he discovered in his lab that if you were to selectively destroy certain areas of the frontal lobe in chimpanzee brains, you could lessen the anxiety states in these chimpanzees. And this was a groundbreaking moment in the idea of, of psychiatric care. The idea that there was a specific part of the brain that you could do something to and change psychiatric disease, which was at this point, something that might as well be, you know, in the hands of, of, of magicians. And so he presented his work in 1935 in London at the Second World Congress of Neurology. And in the audience was a uh, neurologist by the name of Igaz Moniz. He happened to be a brilliant neurologist, already has given the world something called cerebral angiography, which is 
one of the biggest tools that we use today to treat cerebral vascular disease. It's a cornerstone still used. And he was listening to this lecture that John Fulton was giving and soon talked to a friend of his, a Portuguese neurosurgeon named Almeida Lima. And they came up with an operation where they felt that they could in a controlled fashion make certain controlled cuts into a patient's frontal lobe and treat their psychiatric symptoms. And this was called the frontal leucotomy. Very soon after, Walter Freeman, a psychiatrist in Washington DC area, along with his colleague, James Watts, started to apply this frontal leucotomy operation. And their initial patient, they write in one of the initial treatises was, she is more normal than she has ever been. This is a time where there was real therapeutic nihilism in terms of psychiatric disease. There were no treatments, nothing, no medicine. So this was real groundbreaking stuff. Very soon they began to, in the American spirit, try to evolve the procedure. Uh, the uh, frontal leucotomy was a little bit challenging because you had to come in from the top going down and there were a lot of veins in the center of the top of the head. And so they came up with an idea to come in from the sides and sever the same fibers. And that was a first of an attempt to streamline the procedure. Also, interestingly, they, they went from this very delicate uh, uh, instrument called the leucotome. And you can see it's a very millimeter, a couple of millimeters thick. And then there's a little loop that comes out to cut the fibers in a sort of very controlled way. And they went and they started to use a bistery, which is obviously a much cruder looking device. And that heralded a little bit about what was to come. You have to understand frontal lobotomy was not a fringe thing. It really wasn't because it was really helping people in a lot of ways. It seemed like it was helping people. The idea from 36 to 50, there were 20,000 lobotomies done in the United States. From 1942 to 1954, there was over 10,000 in England. And again, not fringe. Moniz wins the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1949 for frontal lobotomy, frontal leucotomy. It's the only time that neurosurgery has ever won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. So around 1945, Freeman was not done evolving the procedure. And the story goes, he was in his kitchen after reading an Italian treatise on anatomy. And, he, and in this anatomy uh, book, you know, he noted that the roof of the orbits where your eyeballs sit in your skull is extremely thin and just so happens to sit just underneath the part of the frontal lobe fibers that are important for frontal leucotomy. And he was always thinking, how do I do this quicker, faster? How do I do this to more people? He said, well, gee, you know, that bone isn't too thick. I bet you we could get through it with a pointy metal device. And he looked through his kitchen, he found an ice pick and he said, that's what we need to do. And he actually invented, he didn't use the ice pick, but he used he essentially call, um, invented a tool called the orbital clast. And essentially what they did was they make a small incision. They go right through the bone of the, of the, of the uh, orbital roof, make the uh, cuts. And this was able to be done. You can see a picture of it right here. Patients sedated, do the operation 10, 15 minutes. You're done with a leucotomy. Um, Freeman wrote every physician his own lobotomist. This is where it kind of the wheels start to come off. Uh, he really wanted to remove the rate limiting step, which is the neurosurgeon. We neurosurgeons tend to be a conservative lot. Ironically enough, we have this sort of reputation of being cowboys. There's not a cowboy element to us. We tend to be pretty conservative. And when Watts saw what he was doing, he severed ties with, with Freeman. Let me give you an idea what this new procedure allowed Freeman to do. From 36 to 48, Freeman and Watts did 625 operations. In 1957 alone, using this transorbital approach, Freeman would drive around the country in his Winnebago, as you see right here, and he was able to, in one year, do another 2,400. In one 12-day period, he did 225 operations. Um, and then it all ended 
1954, the very first real psychiatric medication was invented, thorazine, chlorpromazine, which is essentially a dopaminergic blocker in the brain. And very soon after, many countries begin to outlaw the surgery for psychiatric disorders. Started getting into the 60s and sort of things got conflated with social control. And as politics often unfortunately enter into the realm of medicine, we've recently all experienced that. It was the end of psychiatric surgery in a lot of way. And, and Freeman, to his death, really felt that he was trying to help people. And, felt he, he would often take buckets of letters from grateful patients and dump it onto his critics' desks and say, read these. You know, we weren't torturing people. We were, help, we were trying to help people. Ironically enough, just as an aside, when I first started practicing in, at the University Medical College of Wisconsin, I saw a patient for a separate issue, and we were talking about something and he mentioned that he had a lobotomy as a, as a as a teenager and i was like what and you know because even at that time you know you have this idea of what a, a lobotomy patient i look fine look like a normal person and i ended up looking at the mri and i could not believe how much damage these old procedures did because they didn't have the tools that we have today but this person swore to me that he was helped by this procedure or whatever that's worth. Now, obviously, there was stuff wrong with this with lobotomy. It was a rampant, unchecked use. I showed you that. They did not do controlled studies the way that we conceive of them today. The application of it was shoddy. There was no reliable means of assessment and follow-up. Psychi psychiatry in of itself did not have the tools that we have today. And even after Thorazine came about, there still remained a group of patients that were still desperate for help that Thorazine wouldn't touch. And thus began the second cutting edge, human stereotaxis. So in the cyclical nature of the cutting edge, let's go back now to 1908, the dawn of the 20th century. And on the left, you see Victor Horsley, a neurosurgeon, and his uh, friend Robert Henry Clark, a neurophysiologist and an engineer. And they were interested in studying the brain. And so they, there already was the knowledge that the areas of the brain that were interesting to modulate, make lesions in to create changes in behavior in animals were in the deep center parts of the brain, as you can sort of see on that picture. But the trick is you gotta get to those areas and not mess up the really important surface areas to boot. And so what they did was they came up with this apparatus, a stereotactic head frame, and stereotaxis means to touch space. That's the, the essential derivation of the word. And they were able to design a, a tool that was able to let the neurosurgeon reach down to tiny millimetric areas of the brain without damaging the other areas. And this was largely only used, it was only used for animals. Now, you know, it's funny, you know, when as a kid, you know, it's like, when I was starting to teach, learn geometry, and I was like, when am I going to ever use this? This is all geometry. It's just basic geometry. Fascinating. It took till 1947 for stereotaxis to actually reach mankind. And in 1947 at Temple University, Spiegel, a neurophysiologist and neurologist, and his partner, Henry Weiss, a neurosurgeon, introduce human stereotaxis into mankind's treatment armamentarium. And lo and behold, what's the very first application of stereotaxis? It's a psychiatric procedure. It's dorsal medial thalamotomy, which is a tiny hole in the part of the thalamus for depressive symptoms in a Parkinson's patient. And actually, even after lobotomy died and Thorazine sort of was beginning to take hold, as I said to you, there were still patients that really be, were still medication non-responsive. They were still very, very sick, and they were still, there was not much you could do for them. And there were a series of these stereotactic procedures that were invented through the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s all around the world that kept psychiatric surgery alive, and these are the procedures. And they, they really, really helped patients. Um, but even still, it, 
it, it suffered from the, the sort of the limitations of the era. The results were mostly qualitative. The patients did well, not so well, and things of that nature, because they didn't have the psychiatric scales that we have today. And nobody had a CAT scan. Nobody had an MRI. The imaging that the best kind of imaging that we had was something called ventriculogram, where you would drill a hole in the head, put a tube into the center part of the brain where the fluid filled spaces are called the ventricles. And we would actually fill that up with air and take x rays and you could see a cast of the ventricles and that was what we used to navigate around the brain. And there was no way to do a controlled study, how do you do a sham surgery to sort of compare between the active arm and the unactive arm. So it was a, it's still unethical. We didn't have a way to do a, a sham surgery at that time. And that leads us to the third cutting edge of neuromodulation. So the brain, much like the heart, is an electrical organ. In the same way that the heart when it develops arrhythmias, if we can regulate the electricity of the heart, we can change the symptoms of the heart. Everything that we do as human beings, as far as our brain is concerned, is the result of electrical activity. I said it before, from writing a poem to, to driving a car, to, to watching a movie, all to writing a movie, is the result of electricity in the brain. And, Again, let's go back, cutting edge concept. In 49 AD, a physician in ancient Rome by the name of Scribonius Largus was treating patients with pain from what was presumably gout, terrible, terrible lower extremity pain that they were having. And one patient told Dr. Largus that he was walking along the shore of a river, stepped on an electrical torpedo fish and got a zap, and his pain went away for a few hours. And so because the FDA didn't exist at that time, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Largus grabbed some fish and started zapping patients to treat their pain. And that was the very first use of electrical neuromodulation for it to treat patients. But it took a number of years, 1987, before it sort of matured into a real technology. And this is something that Dr. Alexander mentioned, this is the procedure known as deep brain stimulation. It's a pacemaker for the brain. That's in essence what it is. You can see the pacemaker units in the chest over here and they go into the various areas of the brain. And depending on where you put those electrodes, you can change various uh, different aspects of neurological disease. And I put psychiatric disease in the same bucket as neurological disease. And Dr. Alim Benabid in France, developed the fully modern unit that we are essentially using today to essentially start to treat patients with tremor and Parkinson's disease. And this is the cutting edge of brain surgery today. I'll give you a little bit of an example of what this, this technique, this, this type of concept can do. Um, this is a patient with Parkinson's. He has the DBS implanted. It's been turned off for demonstration purposes in this first video, and then you're going to see it turned on in the next video. Again, young patient, this is Parkinson's disease. Let's go back. There we go. Very briefly, you were diagnosed with Parkinson's when? About 17 years ago. 17 years ago, and you underwent bilateral uh, STN-DBS yes, Three years and a half. Three and a half years ago. Three and a quarter. Three and a quarter years ago. Okay. Just going to examine you very closely. So he's incredibly rigid. On the right, he's got cogwheeling. He's obviously got a lot of rigidity on the left side with some dystonic posture of the upper extremity and the lower extremity as well. Extreme rigidity. Extreme rigidity. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and turn on these units already implanted. <laughs> 
see that right side just relax right away. You can see that left side just... It's like a new man. It's like a different person. So Arthur C. Clarke says that any science... Here you see the, 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 the patient running a triathlon, patient with Parkinson's, and you can see the generators in his chest. You know, Arthur C. Clarke, the science fiction author, said that any science sufficiently advanced looks like magic. And this kind of kind of exemplifies that. Um, and so our group is really determined to sort of apply this potential magic to the patient's that are continuing to suffer with psychiatric disease. And so DBS had, a, besides helping all these patients with Parkinson's and essential tremor, opened a door that has been closed for many years since lobotomy died, essentially. The idea that psychiatric surgery was a sort of dirty thing because of the heyday of lobotomy, but it gave us a second chance. It gave our patients a second chance. And in 1999, a, Bel a Belgian group led by Bart Tan published in The Lancet the use of deep brain stimulation in the anterior limb of the internal capsule of the brain to treat patients with obsessive compulsive disorder. Three or four of the patients did incredibly well. It literally reopened the door for psychiatric neurosurgery. And so today, these are the two major psychiatric diseases that are being explored with deep brain stimulation, mainly because these are probably the best known and characterized diseases known to man in terms of what the disease is, what's the cause of the disease, what are the parts of the brain that are involved. And so it involves obsessive compulsive disorder and major depressive disorder. And you have to see that DBS for psychiatric disease is really a direct evolution from those stereotactic lesion procedures that I talked about that went on from the 40s to the 60s. Essentially, what we're doing is we're taking the areas where they used to make tiny little holes in the brain. If you make a hole, you can't... We have come a long way. <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, so what, if, for example, what we did was we took the area of the brain called the internal limb of the internal capsule that used to be lesion called the anterior capsulotomy. And instead of making a hole, we would place electrodes into this area that we were able to now modulate brain function without it being essentially permanent gives us an ability to now do these sham procedures because you can implant, let's say 100 people, it's quite a number, but let's say 10 people, and five of them you keep off. They don't know that the stimulation's on. The other ones are on, and then you can really scientifically see, are we really helping somebody? It's a really big deal to be able to do that. And again, in the cyclical nature of Solomon, you know, why did we target this particular area of the brain? Essentially, it's echoes of the same logic that Broca once sort of brought to localization. So the internal capsule, this VCVS area, connects to a part of the brain called the orbital frontal cortex. Now, instead of waiting for a patient to have a lesion in the brain to sort of correlate function with a particular damage in the brain, we are now have functional imaging like fMRI and PET, where we can see metabolic changes in the brain in real time and correlate that with behavioral changes. And so it's the same sort of concept that really Broca used to essentially find areas of the brain that were related to speech, and we're doing it today in the same way. The fourth cutting edge is localization. So how does localization now evolve from Broca in the 19th century to the 21st century. So I always tell my students that neurosurgery is, is, is a lot like real estate, right? It's all about location. And you know, obviously, you know, if you're gonna open a donut store, it's probably a pretty good place to, 
to open it next to a, a you know a, a a police officer station, and it's in the same way that if we don't get the localization right, where to place these electrodes, you're not going to see the miraculous results that you saw in that video. So localization is still super super important. But how do we brought how did we bring this now into the 21st century? So one thing that we have known about extracellular stimulation, which is what deep brain stimulation is, electrodes are outside of the neurons, right? They're in the midst of a whole lot of neurons, but they're not inside the neuron itself. So they're stimulating from the outside in, okay? Since the 70s, we know that, we know that, and then that each neuron has different parts of it. And we know from just basic scientific work that the fibers, the, the sort of the outflow tracks of the neuron called the axon or the fiber track is the most sensitive element to any electrical pulse. It's a really important insight because it means that maybe that's the part that we should be targeting. So let's talk about how we've traditionally targeted up until recently. So the traditional 19th century, 20th century, even early 21st century, the way we conceived of the brain is you had gray matter and white matter. Gray matter is where the cells were. White matter was all the connections. And, that's, and this was like high resolution MRI, and that's all that we could basically see. And so the targets were essentially centered around gray matter because that's what we could see, right? It's like that, that joke where some guy is like, trying to look for his keys underneath the lamp in the middle of the night, cop comes up to him and basically says, sir, you know, you know, what are you doing? He says, I'm looking for my keys. And the cop says, well, when was the last time you saw it? He said, well, it was in my house a few hours ago. And he says, well, why are you looking down here? He says, because the light's better here, <laughs> right? And so that's kind of the way we targeted. But imaging has evolved in a very, very special way. Consider that yellow flower. To our eyes, that can only see into a certain wavelength of light. That looks like a pretty plain yellow flower. That same flower to a bee's eyes that can see deeper into the ultraviolet spectrum, that looks, that yellow, same yellow flower looks like a landing pad, right? We now have technology where we can, instead of just look at the gray matter, we can now see all those fiber tracks that connect all those different areas of the brain. Okay. So axonal fiber tracks are essentially tubes and tubes are filled with primarily water. We're, we're creatures of water, 97% of us is water. And so now with a special type of MRI, we can actually track the flow of water in tubes and you can see which direction they flow. And the direction essentially serves as a negative imprint about what the fibers are in the brain. And we call this pattern of connectivity called the connectome. And these tracks define the structural connection of all these different gray areas of the brain that create a network. This is now called connectomic DBS because we are now defining our targets not by the indirect gray matter particular areas where we place it in years past, but into essentially a fiber track based way. So the idea is that we're stimulating locally, but we're influencing a global network that's distributed throughout the brain. I'll show you how this has impacted our work. Major depression. Um, it's really important to put the context because remember I said that this is like a public health issue, if you will. More than 350 million people suffer from depression. If you take all of the diseases combined, all the cancers combined, of, of uh, all cancers combined, the disability from every form of cancer, it is less than the, the cause of disability from depression. It is the single biggest cause of disability in the world, major depression. And so there's a unique opportunity for neurosurgery here to affect global health. Um, my, good friend and colleague Helen Mayberg in 1999 noticed a very special relationship between metabolic changes in the brain, between an area of the brain called the subcolossal cingulate or area 25 and other areas in the frontal lobe. And that there was a pattern of metabolism that went from one pattern 
to a reverse pattern when a patient responded to some form of treatment for depression, whether it be drugs or ECT or cognitive behavioral therapy. And so again, you know, being a pioneer, Helen Mayberg with a neurosurgeon in 2005 decided to use this brand new technology of deep brain stimulation and place an electrode in this subcolossal cingulate area with the idea being that we, if we modulate this function, maybe we can drive the pattern of, of, of metabolism to the correct pattern and treat patients with depression. And they were extremely successful. And this really opened up a huge gold rush once again in treating depression with deep brain stimulation. It, it was, you know, so many different explosion of knowledge and, and, and it culminated essentially into a industry sponsored pivotal trial in 2000, starting in 2008, 200 patients, 15 centers. And it was a double, it was a huge tour de force pivotal trial. And then halfway through the, you know, the FDA mandates what they call a futility trial, a futility analysis where they break the blind internally. And they look at the data and they say, hmm, what's the chance of us actually hitting our endpoints at the end of this trial? So for tech patients, because if, it, if it's 100% futile, you save half the patients from undergoing this futile operation. And it was about 17% chance of success. And the company, because they have to make a corporate decision, pulled the plug on the trial. And yet, whoop, two years later, if you follow these patients, over 50% of them responded, the ones that still remained implanted. So it was working. It just took a little bit longer than we anticipated. And so why did it fail? Because we were using at the time the old style way of targeting the brain, the gray white matter. And it's really kind of a, a testament to this, what, what they did. They, they went back and they looked at responders and non-responders. And if you look at the gray white targeting, there's really no difference between responders and non-responders. But if you look at it with connectomic view, you all of a sudden see a huge difference between responders and non-responders. And so this group, you know, Helen, most, you know, I, I have to really give it to Helen Mayberg. You know, it was a huge failure that was very, very public. And a lot of scientists would just probably crawl away. Not Helen, Helen digs in, Helen digs in. And she actually ended up moving from Toronto to, to Atlanta, Emory, and just to give you an example, they, they kept working at it. They knew that, they could, they, they, that this was working for patients. They just had to figure out a way to make it more reliable so that it passed a trial. And so the anatomic-based targeting in the new six-month response rate that they did in a new group of patients had a response rate of 41%, which was just barely what the FDA would have allowed in the trial. They wanted at least a 40% response rate. Now using this new connectomic technology, that 41% response rate went to 72%. That's a huge improvement. And essentially this has culminated this year in the company now getting a new breakthrough designation to reach, to, to get another bite at the apple, to do another pivotal trial for patients with depression. Because again, huge unmet need, huge cause of disability. And you can see how this new technology has re-given us yet again another chance. I'll just give you one last cutting edge that our group has um, worked with, temporal localization. And this really involves our work with OCD. So if you look at DBS for OCD, there's only about 40 published reports since 1999 in the English literature, less than 200 patients. And the patients do very, very well. But if you notice the percentage of responders are only around 50 to 60%. Now, if you're undergoing brain surgery, it's kind of hard discussion to have with patients and their family that they have about a 50% chance of not responding. It's scary enough to undergo brain surgery and then for them me to be able to look them in the eye and have to say, maybe there's a 40% chance of you not doing well. Plus it takes it's not like, you know, when you saw me turn on the DBS for the Parkinson's disease, you saw the tremor and the dystonia go right away. That's not the way it works in psychiatry. It, there's a lag. 
when you turn things on before you begin to see things change. Why? Well, because there's another aspect of localizing things in the brain. Up till now, you've only talked, you know, you only heard me talk about where, where in the brain. But there's another element of localization, and that's when, when in the brain. What do I mean by that? 1929, what's old is what's new again. 1929, Hans Berger published the first use of electroencephalography, EEG. Essentially, Dr. Berger revealed to man that the brain has rhythms. It not only organizes itself in space, but also in time. And so up till now, we have not taken advantage of that temporal component of localization. And we believe that that's the missing link in terms of getting more response for patients, but more importantly, understanding the lag between turning it on and seeing uh, a response. And much of what we're doing today is now the new generation of devices are able to not only stimulate the brain, but actually record brain signals coming from the brain at the same time. And we're using these patterns of brain activity to help guide our treatment without having to just be wed to looking at how a patient is doing on a behavioral way. And we're designing tasks all around this idea of when in the brain. Um, it's important to understand that the way we conceive of deep brain stimulation is the way, think about it as if you break your hip and they put in a new hip, they don't just say, okay, now go ahead and walk, right? You have to do the rehabilitation. And so we're using these brain signals to create a whole new infrastructure of neural rehabilitation. Yes, in psychiatric disease, but we feel it's globally important across all of the neurological diseases like Parkinson's and tremor that we're using this. And so again, Helen's uh, work is that she uh, created this idea called the quantitative lab. So a neuro circuit based neuro rehabilitation center. And it's this amazing lab space that we have created in our in our center with interactive rooms, cameras everywhere that basically look at minute changes in the way you move in space, your facial expression, all of these things herald a real change in your OCD and your depression long before a patient even knows that they're getting better. Anyway, so, you know, I'm going to conclude here and say that King Solomon was right. The cutting edge is certainly cyclical in nature. We mine the past to elucidate the future. Um, I, I, I have a tremendous amount of philosophical compassion to our forebears. Uh, you know, uh, Freeman is really vilified. I understand why. I, 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 the, he's not without sin, so to speak. But remember, our, our forebears were operating at a time when there was very little technology. And, you know, we all have to understand that one day I'm going to be probably looked on with a lens of being a, a barbarian, and it's just the way it is. Um, psychiatric surgery is the current cutting edge. Historically, as I've shown you, has been always for some reason at this juxtaposition of the cutting edge of technology. There still remains a huge unmet need for suffering patients, and current approaches are already making huge impacts on the quality of life of our patients. Um, I am extremely privileged to work in a group. This is like launching, you know, a rocket to the moon, and it takes more than a village. And this is our village, and um, I always am thankful to them that they are coming along with the ride. Anyway, well, thank you very much. I am happy to take questions. Yeah, all right. Okay, so we're going to open this up to questions. I hope you'll take a couple of questions. Happy to do so. All right, I, I, I can. Uh, uh, I, I'll, I'll bring this out to the. Yeah, that's right. I'll, I'll, I'll bring it out right. to there. But yeah, you know, yeah. since I brought him, I'm going to ask the first question. When, when, okay. when you get when you're getting ready, you get number two. Okay. 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 I'm going to get number one. So, when 
how do you explain to patients that the, that the procedure that you're doing for somebody shaking is the same or very similar procedure that you're doing for somebody's? How do you explain to patients? How do you explain to patients that the procedure that you're doing for somebody shaking physically is this basically the same thing that you're doing for somebody's mental problems? Right. So for so I I first I, I I sort of explained to them that fundamentally I do not think of a difference between Parkinson's or tremor and obsessive compulsive disorder, for instance. They are all neurological diseases. They are all diseases of the brain. The fact that we still call it psychiatric neurosurgery is an anachronism, in my opinion, first of all. Essentially, and I've said this words to many, many patients, essentially, OCD is like the tremor of your limbic or emotional circuitry. That's all it is. It's all the difference. And if you look at it electrically, it is, in fact, very similar electrically. It's just a question of where the electricity is going on in the brain. It's very, very similar. Okay. Go ahead. Um, first of all, um, thank you very much for a fascinating lecture. I appreciate it. Good. Could you speak a little bit to the research, if any, that is being done on um, diseases like fetal alcohol syndrome or cerebral palsy, especially in children? So there, there is a number of, of disease that are, that are the subject of, of, of real work. Um, I do a little bit of work with kids with cerebral palsy because they develop a symptom, a motor disorder, motor symptom called spasticity, which is a type of movement disorder, different than Parkinson's, but still a movement disorder. And um, we basically implant devices that drip minute amounts of medication over the spinal cord in order to relieve their spasticity. Um, fetal alcohol syndrome is not something that I have any real experience with, um, but there's a number of ways that we are looking at psychiatric illness and neurological illness all through the lens of connectomic and circuit type of pathologies. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is, how far along is CMS in improving financial coverage for patients having this surgery, or are the research companies picking up the tab yeah. because it must be humongous? Yeah. So, um, so in essence, um, you know, cost of care in the United States is like a complex issue because what does something cost is like a very, very vague sort of thing. But to answer your question, these trials are paid for by the companies. Generally speaking, nowadays, the way that the companies design it is that they're, in addition, talking to the FDA that says, yes, it's approved. They're at the same time generally talking to CMS, which is the governing body of Medicare in the United States. And so they generally get Medicare, CMS, to look at the study beforehand and say, hey, would you like this? Do you think that the outcome measures are appropriate? And if they are happy with it, then the implication is, is that CMS will pay for it. And if CMS pays for it, generally the third party private insurance payers will pay for it. As CMS goes, generally speaking, the insurance companies kind of follow suit at the, at the end of the day. Right up here? Yes. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Is it working? I didn't know if it's working. Um, Professor Benabid and Polak, I know that in the very beginning, they used to take like 14 hours to do the operation awake. That was with short, the patient 14. awake. Mm -hmm. And then Professor Harry has shortened it to more or less two and a half to three hours for Parkinson's patients. Do you operate with the patient asleep or awake? Great question. Okay. So my very first operation that I did was in 1997. And it took us and it took us 20 hours, 20 hours. I, the patient was encephalopathic. We were encephalopathic. Everybody came out of that operating room like completely, completely blitzed. Um, I do the operations both awake and asleep. We do a lot of research. So sometimes it requires an awake patient to record the signals because those signals that I reference at the end are really only present in an awake patient. When you go to sleep, 
your Parkinson's is gone as well. But essentially, I do surgery on children for dystonia asleep. I do some Parkinson's patients asleep. Um, the psychiatric patients are generally done research, and so they're generally awake through a part of it, but they're asleep through the, the worst part of it. They're asleep through the incision. They're asleep through the hole that we have to make in the skull. They're, so they're, essentially they wake up, the electrodes are in, they're sitting in a chair, they can't see anything. It, it's, a, it's, it's just a very short period of time where they're awake and then they go back to sleep. Now people are probably looking with a horrified look that they're like, wait, awake brain surgery. So here's the, here's the kicker. Your skin has sensory um, endings. Your skull has sensory nerve fibers in it. Your brain, which is what we use to feel and experience the universe, has no brain receptors. And so you can operate on the brain as long as you numb the scalp, you don't feel pain at all at all. It is probably more painful to get a root canal than to have brain surgery. Yes. So I'm just curious because OCD seems a little bit different from, from um, depression. Mm -hmm. is, has anything been correlated with autism? Because that seems to be something that might benefit from uh, electrical. Yeah, so, so autism also is being looked at in the context of a circuit pathology. Remember, well, we're now calling all these diseases circuit pathologies. The idea that there are groups of areas in the brain and it's a result of the abnormal rhythm between these areas that results in the phenomenon of the disease. And so autism too is being looked at from that perspective, not with deep brain stimulation, specifically, but with something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a non-invasive way of stimulating um, in the brain um, in a focal way. So there is it. Um, so in essence, and there has been some case reports of deep brain stimulation for patients with autistic spectrum disorders that were self-harming. So there are some forms of, of autism where the the kids and the people end up like really hurting themselves in a really horrific way. And there have been case reports of doing deep brain simulation that has basically eliminated that behavior. Yes. Uh, if um, deep brain stimulation is the standard of care for Parkinson, um, at what stage of Parkinson is it effective and when is it not? Right. So when we first started doing it in the 90s, it was reserved because it's, you know, it's brain surgery. So it was reserved for patients that were quite a bit advanced. Over the years, the last couple, remember now it's like almost 30, it's 30 years that, you know, DBS has been around. We've started to operate on much earlier and earlier on the disease. So generally speaking, usually by year four or five, most patients have developed the condition in Parkinson's to, to benefit from DBS over just medication alone. And we tend to look for three different things if people are interested. It's either medically refractory tremor, tremor that doesn't respond to meds anymore. Another symptom called what we call motor fluctuation. So the real problem with Parkinson's is that the meds, they always tend to work, but the window where the medications work gets shorter and more and more unpredictable. So patients go throughout, when they first get Parkinson's, very often patients get medication. You can't even tell they have Parkinson's. They do really well for several years. And then that medication window gets shorter and more unpredictable. And people start to isolate themselves because nobody wants to go to like a dinner party and have their meds shut off in the middle of dinner. It's really bad. So motor fluctuations. And then people have seen Michael J. Fox on TV. There's this writhing motion that patients get from the medications, those are called dyskinesias. So once you develop one of those three things, DBS will definitely make your life better than just meds alone. So generally speaking, about four or five years into the disease process, that's when we're operating on you now. Yes, oh, yes. Okay, I'm, a, I'm a recently retired Canadian physician, and I just wanted to share an experience that I had uh, with a patient with uh, your surgery, uh -huh. uh, she was probably, I think she was probably amongst the cohort of the first patients treated in Toronto. So it was quite a while ago, but she had a very severe 
refractive depression with a lot of suicidality. And uh, I, I was amazed. She told me that she had the surgery. She was awake. And as they put the stimulator in her brain, at that moment, she felt as if a veil was uh, lifted from her. It was the most in incredible thing. Uh, she also had some eating disorder, and it didn't seem to help too much with that. But uh, I just wanted to thank you for your interesting talk. And uh, um, I, I think that the work that you're doing is incredible. And I'm hoping it'll help a lot more patients. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate that talk. Thank you. Uh, yes. A, a question. Where does epilepsy fit into this picture, or does it? It, it, it definitely does. And especially in the realm of the temporal localization, because epilepsy fundamentally is like this is this rhythm based disease and so um our group also looks at epilepsy and looks at this in the lens of, of circuit pathologies and it's the same sort of process there are you know localized where in the brain that may be the sort of source or the generator of these bad rhythms but they affect global areas of the brain so Uh -huh. Or what would they have done? So the, the sort of the gold standard typically of epilepsy, there are different types. So epilepsy, unlike Parkinson's disease or even major depression, is a, is a syndrome. It's not a disease, right? So it's, it, it, essentially epilepsy is chronic unremitting seizures, but that can happen in various parts of the brain. If the most treatable form is something called from medial temporal sclerosis. And so it's a small area in the part of the brain called the hippocampus region. And so the, 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 the sort of the old way of doing it, or the sort of the classic way of doing it is doing a temporal lobectomy and you actually cut it out after you map it. But as you can see, we're trying to evolve away from cutting to modulating. And so the same process is going on now using responsive neurostimulation and deep brain stimulation to apply it to to epilepsy as well so it's going on as well what conditions uh, prevent heavy medial stroke <clears throat> what medical conditions oh in other words what would prevent a patient from undergoing a procedure like that generally speaking it's 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 just general medical condition so if somebody just can't tolerate the, the sort of the rigor of surgery untreated heart disease, things of that nature, they, they, um, that might prevent them from doing it. Um, if a patient comes to us very often with Parkinson's, they say they have Parkinson's disease, but they have something that mimics Parkinson's disease, that's not somebody that we would operate on. Um, generally speaking, age is not necessarily a disqualifying feature. I've operated on somebody as young as six and as old as 95. I've operated across the board. And so age, you know, I've operated on 85 year olds that were healthier than some 60 year olds. So it, it really depends on your overall medical condition and making sure that we know what you actually have. Very often patients come to us and they carry a diagnosis, but it takes our group to really dig in and say, mm, that's not really what you have. So Michael J. Fox, by a matter of public record, had a precursor to DBS called thalamotomy, where they, you know, it's a ref I reference these stereotactic procedures where they basically burn the tiny hole in his brain to remove his tremor. So he's had, he doesn't have a lot of tremor. He has all the other stuff that the old operation didn't tr treat. So he's had the old operation, not the new one. We, we have some questions in the back. Let me just finish okay. this. She, she's asked, could it help him? Phenomenologically, yes. Okay, on yeah. that side first. Yes. My understanding is that DBS will not be done if a person possibly has dementia. Mm -hmm. Why? Okay, so that was, that's true and not true. So in the early days when we were just starting to do the, the, the surgery, we typically disqualified patients with quote unquote dementia. Uh, 
And that, what we meant at that time were patients that were so severe in the course of Parkinson's that, remember what I said to you about the analogy of the broken hip and that the idea is that the therapy isn't so much the mending of the hip, it's the rehabilitation afterwards. It's the kind of the same thing with Parkinson's and tremor. It just so happens that most people sort of rehab themselves if you catch them early in the disease. When patients typically develop a lot of dementia with Parkinson's, and remember Parkinson's is not, we call it a movement disorder, but they also have a much higher rate of depression, a much higher rate of OCD. It all ties together. It's not a single, it's not multiple diseases. It's, the more and more we're beginning to dig into it, it's a continuum of disease. And so in essence, when you typically develop a lot of dementia with Parkinson's, there's not enough to rehab afterwards. And so the idea is you're not gonna get tremendous benefit because you're so far advanced. That was sort of the reason why we did that. Now, nowadays, our cognitive testing that we all do on Parkinson's patients before surgery, we pick up dementia. Dementia just means that your cognitive circuitry has been impaired by the Parkinson's. It's very common in Parkinson's because again, you need the, the fundamental chemical that is lost in the brain for Parkinson's is dopamine. And dopamine is not only a moving chemical, it's a thinking chemical. So it's, it's part and parcel of the disease. So we operate on patients with some form of dementia nowadays today. It's just a question of how much. Okay, back here on this side. Yes. Can you talk about the uh, planning the course of treatment for patients who present with um, obsessive compulsive disorder, major depressive, uh, depressive disorder, depending on uh, the uh, the long-standing nature, the history for each patient and the severity, and <clears throat> whether there are comorbid conditions, uh, other, other symptoms. Yeah. So the length of time, uh, the, 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 the number of treatments, uh, the intervals between treatments, you know, this, this the, the fine art of planning. Sure, sure. So great, that's a great question. So again, I, I kind of, use the analogy every one of these patients is we look at it it's like launching launching the space shuttle it it's a it's a big process so typically patients are referred to our center and one of our psychiatrists will evaluate a patient first they will look at their chart they will talk to the old psychiatrists and they will get a real sense is this patient diagnosed appropriately were they treated appropriately up to this point so that's really important part of it then we essentially, we get the scans, the special connectomic scans. We discuss the patients in our conference. We develop a, a targeting strategy for that patient. Um, they undergo neurocognitive testing because that's an important aspect of things as well. And they get a full medical workup. And only after all that is done, do they finally meet me and then we talk about the surgery itself, and then we move forward with the surgery. Um, I, I typically do the surgery in three stages, where I place one electrode on one side of the brain, we wait four weeks, we put the second electrode in on the other side, and then a week after that, as an outpatient, we put the, the pacemaker units in. It, by breaking it up, it makes it a little bit easier than to put it all in and all at once. Does that answer your question? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm just curious. Um, I know that they're doing electrostimulation in Lausanne to get people to walk. And they're doing, um, there's a guy in Spokane, a doctor I wrote, uh, who is doing the miracle drug to get the fibers working. And I'm wondering if there's any correlation or if you know of any correlation between what you're doing and what they're doing to try to get the spinal uh, cord to react so that uh, para paralysis can be improved or eliminated? Yeah, great question. So again, it's another ap application of, ne of neuromodulation. So instead of deep brain stimulation, there is a technique called uh, spinal cord stimulation. And spinal cord stimulation essentially places electrodes over the surface of the spinal cord and stimulates sort of from the outwards in into the spinal cord 
And recently there was a line of research where they took patients that have been complete spinal cord injury patients for years. And they place spinal cord stimulators that have been typically used for treating pain conditions. And they basically, instead of essentially stimulating with the little pain generator, which is a kind of a dumb unit, it's very crude. They did a special pattern of stimulation. Remember what I said about temporal? And they were able to actually get patients that have been spinal cord, complete spinal cord injury, take independent steps for the first time in years. It's, it's, it's mind blowing. It's actually mind blowing. And I've, I was sitting in with friends who are in the rehab field because that's their medicine. And they're just, you know, if it turns out to be the case, if it becomes more widespread, it's going to be a game changer in a lot of ways. Yep. Yes. Hi. Uh, your work is fascinating and phenomenal. Uh, thank you for coming and sharing it with us. Uh, there uh, is currently uh, use for people who suffer from OCD and anxiety and depression. Uh, they are using macro and micro doses of psychedelic mm -hmm. drugs. Mm -hmm. So MDMA, uh, psilocybin, LSD. Ketamine. And, and there's been a great deal of success on even just a one treatment basis. So it's not as invasive as neurosurgery. And there seems to be success there. So uh, how does that correlate when it comes to the brain and the electrical work of the brain uh, related to what happens when these people are given psychedelic right, drugs. Right. So it's all related. You know, it, it, you know, first of all, the patients that we are typically operating on for depression, so psychedelics are generally used now for, for depression, not so much OCD, although there are some people doing it. Um, but we have, we're taking on patients that have failed all that, that have even done the psychedelic trials. But that aside, again, it's all electricity. So whether it be sitting on a couch and talking to a, a therapist or taking a drug like an SSRI, like Paxil, you know, again, the chemicals change the electricity. The electricity is the phenomenon, is the behavior. And so these psychedelics are very powerful serotonergic drugs, much like that mainstay of psychiatric medication, which are serotonergic. They're just, in, in many ways, it's like a new class of serotonergic drugs. But, you know, it's old as what's new again. You have shamans using this medicinally for, you know, thousands of years, and yet we're mining it now for the future. It's a perfect example of Solomon's treatise. And so it, it is related because it's just a, a chemical way of modulating the electricity. You bet. Oh, how about two more? One here and then there, because I already said yes to her. So, so PTSD is, is an interesting anxiety spectrum disorder. Um, ironically enough, even though PTSD is horrendous in terms of the people that are suffering from it, it is actually a much more treatable disease than like treatment resistant depression or OCD. Those are very hard to treat. Um, for instance, there's recent work utilizing MDMA in patients with PTSD and they really respond well to, to MDMA. So it's a very potentially treatable, but it's the same kind of concept. It's a circuit pathology that can be treated through this process. There is a colleague of mine at UC, at, 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 in Texas and in UCLA that are trying to do DBS for, for PTSD as well. I know that there is a trial going on. Okay. One last one, where? <laughs> yes. So I'm just wondering, a lot of times when people are on medication for depression, they stop taking it. Yeah. So with this, the surgery that you're doing, do people ever turn it off? Turn off the stimulation? Yeah. Never. No, because when it works, it really works. 
what's really interesting about the response about, about depression in particular is that if you tend, so the way we define response and remission in, part, in, in, in major depression is based on one of two scales, either the Hamilton depression scale or the MADRAS, the Montgomery Asperg depression rating scale and MADRAS. And essentially, if you get to one particular score, if you have a 50% reduction in your baseline scores, you're called a responder. And this is based on old pharmacological studies, essentially of drugs. That's how we defined it. If you had a 50% reduction in your baseline score, you were a responder. If you go below a certain critical number, you, you're what we call remission. Essentially, you're cured. The thing about DBS, and remember, we're, they're coming to us having tried everything, every med, every psychedelic, ECT, TMS, everything, and they're coming to us completely refractory. If they get DBS in the subcolossal cingulate, right now, based on our numbers, around 70% of chance that if you will not only just respond, if you tend to respond, you go right to remission. There's not a lot of patients that are in between. There's something that it just tips you right over to the well state. Yes, oh, okay, I'm sorry, that's it. That's it, sorry, thank you.